Okay, let's begin. So what, what is a membrane? A membrane is a partition or separation. It's basically a gate. حاجة تفصل حاجة أخرى. For example, here we have a cell. And this is the cell membrane. It's separating the external environment from the internal environment. So basically, a membrane is just something that separates from something else. طيب, now when we talk about body membranes, uh, the body has membranes that serve vital functions. For example, protection and lubrication. Lubrication means it lessens friction. So you prevent damage. Uh, a basic example of a, of a body membrane is the skin. And what type of uh, membrane is it? Is it it's an uh, epithelial membrane. And we will talk about the different types of membranes in the upcoming slides. Like before we talk about epithelial membranes, we want to know what is epithelium. Epithelium is layers of cells that line the inside of organs or cover the outer surface. Like what is meant, first of all, by line the inside of organs. Let's say here, for example, this is the inside of the stomach. The lumen here, يعني جوة المعدة مثلا. The orange thing you see here, we call this lining. We call this a lining. So this would be epithelium. And it, it's present in almost all the organs. For example, uh, inside the intestine. In, from the inside, the lumen, the wall itself, the inner wall, it's lined by epithelium. Another example would be the lungs. Another example would be the gallbladder and and so on. OK, so anything from the inside that's covered, the inner wall, we call that the lining and it's usually epithelium. And then something that covers the outer surface, like the skin. Like here, this is the skin. This is the superficial part of the skin. It's called the epidermis. And we're going to talk about the skin later on in the presentation as well. So epithelium is layers of cells that line the inside of organs. OK, now let's talk about epithelial membranes. Um, we have three types. We have cutaneous membranes, like I just said, the skin, specifically the epidermis, because some parts of the skin are not uh, epithelial. They're made up of uh, like a different type of tissue, and we'll talk about it uh, in the upcoming slides. But specifically, the epidermis is uh, an epithelial membrane. OK, and then we have the mucous membranes. Uh, for example, the lining of the oral cavity and the serous membranes, uh, like the pleura. The pleura is something that covers the lungs. It lines the lungs and it also, sorry, it covers the lungs and it, uh, it lines the pleural cavity. And we will talk about it later on as well. But how do you distinguish between mucous membrane and serous membrane? Mucous membrane is cavities it lines cavities that are uh, open to the exterior, to the external environment, like the mouth, for example. Uh, for example, the mouth, the nose, and it produces a mucous fluid. يعني يا شباب السوائل اللي في الفم, السوائل اللي في الخشم, these are all produced by mucous membrane, and it's called mucous fluid. The serous membranes are not open to the external environment. For example, in the lungs. Inside the lungs, you can't reach it. It doesn't go outside, so it, we call it serous membrane. And it produces a serous fluid, like a watery fluid. Time now. Let's talk about uh, connective tissue. Uh, connective tissue is tissue that provides support, protection, and gives structure to the other tissue. Basically, it's tissue that gives structural support. What are some examples? Bone, cartilage, ligament, tendons, blood vessels, uh, adipose tissue, tissue under the skin. Uh, tissue under the skin, what I mean here is the subcutaneous tissue. This, okay? Uh, right here, the superficial layer is the epidermis, which is epithelial tissue. And then here in the middle, we have the dermis, something called the dermis, okay? This is also connective tissue. So this entire thing, what you see in the picture is the skin, okay? And the, the layer that's on top, the epidermis, is epithelial tissue. And the rest here, which is the dermis and the subcutaneous tissue, is connective tissue. Okay, so let's talk now about connective tissue membranes. So first we have the synovial membrane, which lines cavities of the joints. 
So over here we have the knee joint, okay? And the lining, so all this, what you see, is we call it synovial membrane. Any joint that has this lining is called synovial membrane, and it's a connective tissue membrane. Uh, the bursa, it's a fluid-filled sac. Zil ballana, yani, juwata moya. It acts as a cushion between muscles and ligaments. It lessens friction between the structures. It basically just lessens friction so that when you when there's a lot of movement, for example, you're running, you're moving around, there's less friction and it protects your structures like the muscles, the bones, the ligaments. Uh, and it's also considered a connective tissue membrane. So, so far we have synovial membrane and bursa, which are connective tissue membranes. Let's talk about two other connective tissue membranes, which include the tendon sheaths. Uh, they surround the tendons in the body. What are the tendons? The tendons are connected to muscle. So you see all these things here. These are tendons. They connect to a muscle, and then when the muscle contracts, these tendons move and allow you to move your fingers, for example, or anything else. So the tendon sheaths are connective tissue membranes that cover these tendons. Uh, next, we have the meninges. The meninges are also very important. The meninges are connective tissue membranes that cover this, the central nervous system. What is the CNS or the central nervous system? It's basically your brain and your spinal cord. The brain and the spinal cord together, they are called the CNS. And something that's wrapping them, three layers of uh, membranes are called the meninges. Uh, we don't need to go into detail about each one, but I just want you to know in general that the brain and the spinal cord are covered by connective tissue membrane called meninges, and they are three layers, and we'll, we'll talk about them in upcoming lectures, inshallah, too. So in summary about uh, membranes, we have epithelial membranes, like the skin, specifically the epidermis layer. We have mucous membranes, like the oral cavity and the, and the nose, for example. And we have serous membranes, like the covering and lining of the lungs, which is called the pleura. Uh, connective tissue membranes, we have synovial membranes, which line the joints. We have the bursa, which are the fluid-filled sacs that protect uh, against friction in your joints as well, or near the joints. And we have the tendon sheets, which wrap, ar which wrap around the tendons. And we have the meninges, which cover the CNS components, the brain and the spinal cord. What's the importance of the skin? First of all, the skin is the largest organ in the human body. And it's very, very important when we do physical exams. Uh, when we do fahs for the patients, it's very important because there are a lot of uh, findings that can give us a clue about the disease. For example, here we have something called cyanosis, which is blue discoloration. Uh, you can see it in the skin sometimes, and it can be indicative of many diseases. Uh, like some sort of respiratory disease or congenital heart disease uh, and so on. And there are many other uh, skin findings like uh, cyanosis and so on. Uh, you don't need to know them in detail. Uh, you just need to know that it's, the skin is very important in physical examinations. Types. Let's talk about some functions of the skin. Uh, the skin is very important for protection. It protects against microorganisms like bacteria, uh, viruses, fungi, and so on. It also protects you from the sun specifically the ultraviolet radiation, which can cause skin cancer. Uh, it, it prevents dehydration, fluid loss, because as you know, the fluid is it's present in the blood vessels, and it's also present in, the, in between the tissue itself, but from the inside, not the outside, of course. So the skin protects the fluid from leaving your body, and it prevents dehydration. And whenever there's a burn, you can get severe dehydration, because when there's a burn, you destroy the skin. When you interrupt the skin, uh, you can lose fluid. You can get dehydration. Uh, it's also important in thermal regulation. Whenever your body heats up when you're playing, you sweat. The sweat cools you down, basically. So it's, it's considered a heat loss mechanism. Sensation. The skin has many uh, nerve endings. It also has skin uh, sensory receptors. And there are many types of sensory receptors uh, that sense touch, vibration, and things like that. Um, and the final thing that's also very important is synthesis and storage of vitamin D. Vitamin D is important for calcium. Um, basically, vitamin D, yeah, you, don't, you don't need to know this, but this is just for information. Vitamin D, you get it from two sources. You get it from the skin 
and you get it from the diet, from eating food. So skin is also very important for vitamin D, so you can keep uh, a good storage of calcium in the body for bone health. Okay, let's talk about the specific layers of the skin. We have the epidermis, which is the epithelium that we talked about, the cellular layer. And we have the dermis, which is right beneath it, which is the connective tissue layer. So if we zoom in here, so this part over here is the epidermis. And this huge part is the dermis. The epidermis is avascular, doesn't have any uh, blood vessels. All the blood vessels are in the dermis. Okay, this is very important. It can come up as a question in your MCQs. The epidermis is avascular. It is supplied by the dermis. So the blood vessels in the dermis, they supply the epidermis, and that's how it, that's how it survives. And actually, the very, very top layer of the epidermis, it consists of dead uh, cells, and we'll talk about this later. Because of the fact it's avascular, it doesn't have uh, blood vessels, blood supply. Okay. Okay, let's talk about uh, the epidermis. Uh, it's, made, it's made up of cells called keratinocytes, which produce a tough protective outer protein called keratin. So it's described as keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So what does this mean? Keratinized is referring to the uh, keratin protein I just talked about. Stratified means there are many layers. Stratified means there's a lot of layers. That's what stratified mean. Squamous, squamous sorry, means flat. So this right here is flat, so we say squamous. And epithelium, because it's an epithelial tissue. Um, like I said before, it's avascular. There's no blood vessels or lymphatics. And it has a rich nerve supply. Uh, dermis. dermis is a dense layer that consists of collagen and elastic fibers. These are basically proteins that are present in the dermis. Uh, it accounts for the strength and toughness of the skin. Okay, we can actually see that this makes sense because if you see here in the picture, look at the dermis. It's way thicker than the epidermis. So you can see how it accounts for the strength of the skin. And it is vascular. It nourishes the epidermis like I also mentioned before. It has blood vessels, lymphatics. It also has sensory receptors and uh, other things we'll talk about soon. Okay, let's talk about the integumentary system. The integumentary system consists of the skin and the associated structures like the hair, nails, sweat, and sebaceous glands. Um, let's talk about the, the sweat and the sebaceous glands. First of all, they're located in the dermis here. So for example, uh, right here, this is a sweat gland and this is a sebaceous gland. Sweat gland is for sweating and the sebaceous gland, it uh, produces something called sebum which basically lubricates your skin. It's like an oily substance, okay? And they're both present in the dermis. So the sweat and sebaceous glands are present in the dermis. Okay. Tai, what tissues make up the skin? So the skin, when we talk about the skin, we have the epidermis, the superficial layer, and then the layer underneath it, the dermis we just talked about. And then we have sensory receptors and nerve endings, which are present in the epidermis and the dermis. And we also have smooth muscle called erector pili muscle, which is this muscle right here. It's called the erector pili. When it contracts, it causes goosebumps. Sometimes if you're scared or if uh, your body becomes cold, you get goosebumps. And this is due to the erector pili muscle contracting. So all these tissues, epidermis, epithelial tissue, dermis, connective tissue, sensory receptors and nerve endings, these are going to the brain, so nervous tissue. Erector pili muscle from the name muscle, so it's uh, smooth muscle tissue. Um, later on in upcoming lectures, we'll talk about what's the difference between smooth muscle and skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. But in general, smooth muscle is muscle you don't control. So they are involuntary muscle. Uh, the body, uh, it contracts by itself, basically, not under your control. That's what I'm trying to say. A few additional points on the epidermis. Its thickness varies depending on the location. So, for example, in the eyelids, it's very thin uh, because your eyelids, they don't undergo trauma. Uh, compared to your palms, for example, there's a thick epidermis. There's more cells, more layers of cells because your hands are more prone to trauma and more prone to uh, physical activity and stress. 
Okay, the epidermis also gives rise to hair, sweat, and sebaceous glands, but these structures are found in the dermis. So what do I mean by this? So we say hair, sweat, and sebaceous glands. Okay, let's look at the picture. So here we have the sebaceous glands, the sebaceous glands, the sweat glands, and we also have the, the hair follicles right here. Okay, and here's another hair follicle. They're all in the dermis, okay? Their origin is in the dermis, but they give rise or they go through the epidermis. So for example, here you have the duct of the sweat gland. Here you have the hair coming up in the epidermis. So this is what we mean. Um, uh, but what's, uh, what's most important is that you know that these structures I just described, the hair, sweat, and sebaceous glands, uh, they originate in the dermis, not the epidermis. Uh, this is a summary of we discussed of ab about what we discussed uh, on the skin. We have the epidermis, which is epithelial tissue. We have the dermis, which is connective tissue, and we have something called the subcutaneous tissue, or the hypodermis, or the superficial fascia. They all they're all the same thing, and it is also connective tissue. So this is connective tissue, this is connective tissue, the epidermis is epithelial tissue. And the connective tissue, it contains a lot of the fat. Let's talk more about the dermis. In the dermis, right here, this layer, there's something called dermal papilla. These dermal papilla, what does papilla mean, first of all? Papilla means a finger projection, a finger-like projection. So you can see here, these are papilla, they are finger-like projections. Um, they're thrown they cause an indentation in the epidermis, which causes you to have epidermal ridges or fingerprints. Okay, so the fingerprints or the epidermal uh, ridges, they are due to the dermal papilla. And they're important for gripping ability. And uh, these, are, uh, these are patterns that are genetically determined and unique. So each individual is going to have different uh, fingerprints, which are, which are due to the dermal papilla. Let's talk about um, something else that's uh, that's special to the dermis. In the dermis, there are collagen fibers that run all in the same direction, and get, this gives rise to something called cleavage lines or tension lines. For example, in the limb, the cleavage lines run in a longitudinal direction, like this. In the neck and trunk, in the neck and trunk, they run transversely, like this. So let's talk about why these are important. So let's say you're doing a surgery and you're going to make an incision. If you make the incision across or perpendicular to the tension lines, like this, because the tension lines are going this way, the, the cleavage lines is more likely to gape, so the wound isn't going to heal properly. So instead, you have to make an incision with the tension lines. So here the incision and the tension lines are parallel. And this is how the incision should be made, and surgeons have to know these have to know this fact uh, because it uh, allows for better wound healing and less gaping and complications due to the incisions. And there are many, many complications of surgical incisions like infections and so on. But what are the flexure lines? They are dermal folds that come near joints. They're also called flexion creases. It's the same thing, flexion creases or flexure lines. Um, yeah, basically they're due to dermal folds. That's all you need to know. So summary, the dermal papilla, uh, the finger-like projections in the dermis, they're the ones that are responsible for the epidermal ridges, the fingerprints, which are genetically unique. The collagen fibers running in parallel direction in the dermis, um, they're responsible for the tension of the cleavage lines, and when you make, they're important for surgical incisions. They have to be parallel with the tension lines to, uh, to prevent complications like gaping and improper healing of the wounds. And the dermal folds, they're responsible for the flexure lines or the flexion creases. Um, yeah, that's it. So let's talk about uh, hair. We have uh, something called the hair follicle, which is this right here. This is called the hair follicle. And we have something called the hair shaft, which is this. So what you see up here is the shaft. Here's the hair follicle. Um, the hair root or follicle is surrounded by dermal and epi by a dermal and epidermal sheath. So right here, the white, this is the epidermal sheath, and this is the dermal sheath. 
and obviously this is the hair root or the hair follicle. Hair root and hair follicles it means the same, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Then here we have the hair bulb. So right here, this is the bulb. It's concave, and it can it occupies or it can it contains uh, vascular connective tissue called the hair papilla. So this right here is the hair papilla, the blood vessels, and here is the hair bulb. Okay. Let's, th let's talk more about the rectal pili muscle. When it contracts, it makes the hair go upright. So let's say this is the hair. If this rectal pili muscle contracts, it's going to go in this direction, this direction, this direction, and it's going to cause dimpling of the skin. And this is usually a response to cold or fear, and it's under sympathetic control. What does sympathetic control mean? It's basically an innervation, a specific type of innervation called sympathetic control. And you will take it in upcoming lectures. Don't worry about it now. Taib, I think this is the final uh, topic of today's lecture, which is uh, the nails. The nails are basically basically modifications of the epidermis that are heavily keratinized. So basically, it's kind of like skin with a few changes, with a few changes, which includes heavy keratinization, which is the tough uh, protect, uh, protective outer protein. The function of the nails to pick up small objects and scratch uh, an itch if you have itching. So the main parts of the nails includes the nail plate, which is this right here, the free edge, and the root, the nail root. Okay. The nail plate rests on something called the nail bed. The nail bed is basically epidermis. It's basically skin. It rests on the nail bed. And the, and the nail root is embedded in, is also embedded in skin. Here, the nail matrix. Uh, the nail matrix is basically part of the nail bed, which is responsible for the nail growth. Okay. Like, why do nails appear pink? It's because of the capillary, capillaries underlying the dermis. So right here, we have the epidermis, the nail bed. And then underneath it, we have the dermis, of course, and you see all these blood vessels. They're the ones that are responsible for making the nail look pink. The white crescent over here, the crescent means the hilal. So the hilal abyad, this is called the lunule, and we have the skin folds. Uh, we have skin folds over here, laterally, proximally, and laterally again. Uh, these are called nail folds, okay? And we have the cuticle, which is a nail fold that projects onto the nail. So this is the cuticle over here. It's basically this nail fold, the nail fold here projecting onto the nail. It gives you the cuticle. And then we have the hyponychium, which is beneath the free edge where the dirt accumulates. And here, tahat. here the hyponychium. Okay, and this basically uh, ends our lecture today. Uh, إذا عندكم أسئلة أو شيء حياكم